Hi, uh, welcome. This week we'll be looking at the Year of Living Dangerously, and I wanted to remind you that there's a lot of similarities between Year of Living Dangerously and The Quiet American. They're set in uh, Southeast Asia, and they're set earlier on, 50 years or so ago, and they're both dealing with the Cold War, and there's a lot of similarities in terms of the protagonist and some of the issues. Now, right at the beginning of this page, which is the schedule for the last half of the course, you've got a rundown, in a sense, of the similarities. And you could pick any of those similarities to write your essay on. I've also got a couple of sample essays. There's one in, on Quiet American, a uh, sample essay. And then there's also, as I've listed down here, a sample essay on Year of Living Dangerously. So those essays are really close in a way to the types of things I'm talking about in the videos. So they kind of act as a bit of a summary of some of the elements. And they might even act as a bit of a summary for the novels themselves, or at least some of the key elements in them. Now you're welcome to use these ideas, and you're welcome to use anything I say in your essays, but try to take an angle that's new or take something I've said and push it in a new direction so I've got this written down here, the types of things you might want to do with this sample essay, uh, both on The Quiet American and The Year of Living Dangerously, and you might want to take a look at those. I've also listed the different texts that, or different pages that you could go to. You've already seen this page, Colonialism and the Cold War, it gives a larger geopolitical context and uh, you can see here that there's Ho Chi Minh and Sukarno. And of course, Sukarno in the novel is moving to the left. He's moving uh, toward communism. And this is a threat to a lot of people. And uh, there's the issue of the Cold War comes up. So it's a sort of a post-colonial situation. Unlike in the, year of the, uh, unlike in the Quiet American, uh, where the French are still there, it's at the very end of the French control of, uh, in, of Vietnam and Indochina. Whereas in the Year of Living Dangerously, Indonesia is already independent, but there's still this legacy of Dutch colonialism. And of course, one of the big powers in Asia, in Asian colonialism, is, is the British. And so we get a lot of references to the British who are in Malaysia. Burma at one point was a province of India. It was in India, of course, a huge uh, area of, of an enormous number of people and places, and the British controlled it for quite a, quite a while under colonial rule. And uh, so they're, they're big players in the colonial realm. And then, of course, the Americans kind of come in with a neo-colonial uh, politics. And so Indonesia is, in a sense, it's sort of influenced by the other colonial players, particularly the Dutch and the British, and it's influenced by the neo-colonial, and it's also influenced by China and Russia, and hence we have the uh, party that's leaning towards Peking or Beijing in China, but also we have the Soviet spy Vera, right? So we've got these Cold War elements, which you could connect largely to British and American politics in terms of capitalism during the Cold War. And so I've gone through this before, and you might want to take a look at it again. So going back to the schedule, you've also got a context here. And this is really more specifically connected to Indonesia. Sorry, my internet seems to be a little slow today. So we've got some maps and different graphics. Particularly important here, I think, is the Wayang, the Wayang puppet theater and the uh, puppet master who's the Dalang, you've got it worked throughout the novel. For example, the parts of the novel, um, and I don't know how to pronounce Indonesian, uh, Bahasa Indonesia, um, I don't know how to pronounce the language, so I would just say Patet Nem is the first part of the novel, which apparently is from 9 to midnight of the performance of the Wayang Theatre. And then the second part, Patet Sangha, is from 12 to 3 in the morning. This performance goes all night. And Patet Manjur is from 3 in the morning till 6 in the morning. And this is there's the cycle, I guess, that often gets played in little villages. And this is the type of thing that Hamilton doesn't really pay attention to. He's starting to get an idea about 
he's on the outskirts of uh, a town and he's seen the Wayang theater being played, but he doesn't really understand it. And so Kosh makes a lot of the idea that the Westerner, in this case an Australian, but in the quiet American, it was Fowler. But Kosh makes an even bigger point that the Australian doesn't really understand the culture that he's dealing with. He's reporting on it, but he doesn't understand it. So the novel, in a sense, is using the Wyong Theatre as something that shows a different structure that Hamilton doesn't really get. But he starts to appreciate it more and more throughout the novel. And Kosh, as a writer, is using this, this structure of the Wyong in many, many different ways. And so it's, it's a huge motif that comes up again and again. So you'd want to just read this so you know what it is exactly that's being referred to here. There's also a few photographs that I think are interesting. This is the world that we're dealing with, not this world today. So you have to take your mind back to 1965. And there's some information about Sukarno and his presidents. And there's also some President, in being a president, and also there's some information about the hotel in Indonesia, which is a lot more important than the hotel in Quiet American, although both hotels are really key to uh, the settings. Um, I would say in, in Quiet American, it's, it's a little bit more subtle and it's not quite as heavy-handed as we'll see. I wouldn't say heavy-handed, it's not quite as heavy as a symbol as in Year of Living Dangerously. So it's a little bit of information you might want to look at there. Also, the events in 1965 are very confusing, and it's not hard to under hard, it's not easy to see what's happening. And, and Hamilton also can't see what's happening. He can't see how much Sukarno is getting close to somebody like Fidel Castro. And of course, remember the Cuban the Cuban Revolution is at 1959, right? And so it's not that distant in terms of time. And so Ho Chi Minh and, and Castro are big figures in the world and Sukarno is getting close to it and we don't know exactly the relationship between him and the Communist Party and we don't know how these things worked out exactly. And, and we can see this in the novel because Hamilton doesn't know what's going on either. It's a little bit like it's, a, it's behind the scenes. And of course it's also seen in terms of the Wayang Theatre where the puppet master is behind the screen. And so if you look at the way that the Wayan works, you've got the puppet master behind the screen using puppets, and he's got a light, and the oil lamp is really important because it comes up early. The oil lamp sh casts light against the puppets, and that shadow gets cast against a screen. And of course, the audience sees from the other side of the screen. And so Hamilton, somebody who looks at this theater of politics in Indonesia, and he's he's a, on the he's on the side of the screen where you can't see who's actually operating the puppet show, right? And this is really important sort of metaphor motif that uh, Kosh develops in a really deep way, uh, and we see Sukarno as the puppet master, um, and Hamilton is trying to figure out what is he doing, but Hamilton doesn't understand Indonesia. He doesn't understand something like the Wayang Theater. At one point, as I say, he's on the outskirts of Bandung, the town, the city, and uh, he's got the opportunity to see a Wayang theater. But he gets detracted. He, he gets distracted by Vera, the Russian Soviet agent, the beautiful woman, and he goes off. And so he doesn't really understand about Indonesia. And this is a really ingenious post-colonial strategy that Kosh uses to show that, you know, somebody like an Australian can't necessarily just go in an immediate report on a country because you may not understand the country, right? And so there's a lot of interesting things that happen in 1965 that are still a bit murky to people, even now, to everybody. Um, but this is a rundown of the events, so this should help you to see how Sukarno goes from being this socialite, um, popular leader to somebody who loses his power. And, uh, you know, he's behind the scenes and he's the Dalang in the puppet. He's the puppet master, but then he loses to Suharto, who becomes the new puppet master, if you like. So you might want to look at that. And, you know, I don't expect you to understand all the ins and outs of the politics. I certainly don't. But you can see the way that Kosh is using this as a narrative device to structure the novel. 
Also, you could take a look at this essay and article, which might serve as a bit of an introduction to some of the important themes in the novel. Uh, also, could give you some ideas about what you might want to write about, but you wouldn't want to be repeating my ideas. You'd want to take some ideas and push it further. Here, I'm focusing on the idea of poverty and how important it is in the novel. So the title of the sample essay is Feed Your People. Global disparities, or oops, disparities. No, it's obviously I need to proofread here. Disparities, differences in wealth are always a problem. Yet these disparities can be made worse in times of political conflict. In Year of Living Dangerously, the gap between rich and poor is crucial to the setting and the political moment. Yet it's also crucial to the personal dilemmas of Billy, Kumar, and Hamilton. So I'm going to point out, I'm going to explore how it's important to those three characters. While Hamilton isn't at first bothered by questions of economic disparity, he's soon thrust into a third world setting brimming with poverty and anger. He stays at the five-star hotel Indonesia, which is described as a luxury liner floating through the darkness of the world below it. On his first night in Jakarta, he and Billy wander out from the hotel and the refuge of the Wyong Bar, with its puppets on the walls sneering at the noisy Westerners, and into the poverty and metaphoric darkness of the city. So part of, part of the reason that I'm reading this is just to draw your attention to the fact that you've got these sample essays, but they, they also connect quite closely to what I'm looking at in the videos, and I'll be looking at this first chapter where they go out into the darkness. Billy asks Hamilton that this poverty makes him want to do something. And Hamilton responds that it's up to Sukarno to fix the problem. This leads us to gauge the gap between Sukarno's rhetoric, which Billy accepts initially, and reality, which Billy sees all too clearly in the end. You know, for example, you could be uh, interested in that point, and you might think, okay, well, what is the difference between abstract ideas, like we looked at in the previous class, in the previous video, uh, about communism or religion, and, you know, which Fowler is saying he's not interested in, he's interested in the, the reality of what people are actually living. And here, Billy seems to have that same interest, so you could maybe compare those two, for example. And reality, which Billy sees all too clearly in the end, and you'd want to take that idea and find an angle to explore it, and to use the text like I'm doing in these videos, to take parts of the text and connect them. So what happens at the beginning? What happens next? What happens next? And take the, the moments of the text and don't just say what happens as a summary, but connect the parts. Connect one part earlier to the next part. And how does it change? And how does the character change with the things that you're analyzing as you go along the way, right? This leads us to gauge the gap between the rhetoric and reality. Sakarno is accused of making speeches and building monuments when what his people need is rice and clean water. Billy gradually becomes disenchanted with Sakarno, especially when Udine dies in Ibu's slum, presumably from unclean water. And again, I know that all of this is a, in a sense, it's a spoiler, and you find out about these things beforehand. But as I say, I think that if a lot of you are probably only going to read the novel once, you kind of need to know what's happening in the end in order to appreciate. For example, as soon as you see Ibu come up, you'll notice that she's connected to a major theme in the novel. Billy becomes increasingly desperate and eventually risks his life by putting up a sign with a direct, simple message. Sukarno, feed your people. While Billy sinks into despair and near suicidal action, Kumar acts secretly to change the economic order of the country. His membership in the Communist Party is suspected early in the novel, yet it isn't treated in a simplistic manner by Kosh. Instead of being the cold-hearted, single-minded, cold warrior of the James Bond novels, Kumar is a compassionate, intelligent man who articulates his concerns effectively to Hamilton. And instead of being a bitter anti-colonialist, Kumar befriends and protects Hamilton and he dreams of sitting in a cafe in Europe, even though he knows this is impossible. He calls it water from the moon. A conservative Australian, Hamilton disagrees with Kumar's conclusions about the need for communist revolution. And here you can see a little bit of a difference between Graham Greene, 
who was critical of communism and Castro, but he also had a lot of sympathy for Castro and communism too. And so when we get to Christopher Koch, he's pretty strongly on a more capitalist side and a more conservative side. Uh, and yet he builds into his character, Hamilton, doubts about this capitalist system and about the power of the West. Hamilton disagrees with Kumar's conclusions about the need for communist revolution. Yet he's still bothered by Kumar's complaint that intelligent people in poor countries live in poverty, while stupid people in rich countries live in comfort. That's a really powerful point that, that I think Kosh is getting at here. At the end of the novel, Hamilton is metaphorically blinded. And again, if you could connect this to his inability to see the Wayang Theatre and his turning away from the Wayang Theatre when he's on the outskirts of Bandung. This may signify that he can't see into the puppet mastery that leads from Sukarno to Suharto. And remember, I was saying that Sukarno, the president, is seen, you know, we see this in chapter one, he's seen as the, the Dalang or the puppet master, right? And one of the points he makes is that if the puppet master is not careful, and Quan makes this point, Billy Quan makes this point, then he might actually become a puppet. And this is what happens. Su Suharto takes over and Sukarno becomes a puppet rather than the puppet master. That he can't see into this, nor into the culture that's represented by the Wayang theater outside Bandung, which Hamilton misunderstands, undervalues, and foolishly foregoes. His blinded eye may also symbolize his lack of insight, not into the problem, because he sees that pretty clearly. He's an intelligent person. He can see the poverty and he can see the economic situation. And he knows the world set up in this really unequal way. So it's, he, it's not that he lacks insight into the problem, but rather into the solution to poverty and the desperate violence it breeds. So that's a sample that you might want to take a look at. Here, there's also an article that would be good to look at. I've also got a tricky narrative. Two visual helps to get at this, because it is a tricky novel. Um, and there's a lot, of, a lot of things in it that you're probably not used to thinking about when you're watching a TV show or a novel. But you've got different levels of narration going on here. Obviously, there's the author, Kosh himself. And Cookie isn't necessarily the same as Kosh. And so some of the things that Cookie says are a little bit biased and probably, mm, you know, not, they lack in sophistication at times. And you wonder, well, is this a failure of Kosh or is Kosh creating a narrator who has some of these biases and has some of these limitations? Because he set up this idea of levels of narration. And then you've got Cookie telling the story from the files of Billy, who also sees himself as a kind of a Dalang or puppet master who is setting up Hamilton and Jill. And you've got all these people who the story's about, and Sukarno believes himself to be and is, in fact, nationally the puppet master, except that he doesn't, doesn't understand how Suharto is taking control from him. And of course, whether it's Suharto or Sukarno as president, you've got the people. And you've got the military, the economic elite, the people. And then you've got people like Kumar, who represent um, an intelligent, educated part of the population. And you've got the Bet Jack boys, who represent, in a sense, the workers, the average person, right? And so they're really important, very similar to what we saw in The Quiet American with the, uh, the Trishon drivers. And uh, there's other parts that go deeper here into the kind of poverty that Kosh is trying to get at and that Hamilton is bothered by and Quan is completely anguished by. You know, the cemetery girls. You know, the, it's kind of sad. Sorry, I get emotional sometimes. Um, and, you know, the women who are so poor that they're going to go out and, you know, do whatever in the cemetery for, for money. And uh, you've got Ibu, who seems to perhaps have been doing that at the time. You've got her sick son. And it's really quite sad when you think about 
this layer. Sorry, I don't know why I'm getting so emotional. It's it's a it's a novel, I know, but it's got a lot of kind of heart to it that delves into these questions of um, poverty. And uh, so this graph, I think, this graphic helps you to see how that works. And of course, this image here is a puppet, and uh, that would be used in the Wayang uh, Kulet theater. Here's also a narrative line. And yeah, here's like the puppets and there's the, the light that's behind there and you've got the puppets have their shadows cast upon the screen and the, the villagers watch from the side of the screen where they don't see the puppet master, but they see the shadows and the characters. Here I've also got a narrative line which talks about the Wayang and about the Betjaks and about some links to Hinduism and about some other things just to situate where stuff comes up in the novel. Okay, so let's just go back to uh, the schedule. And I was listing these things. There's also some information on Hinduism. Um, there's only a very small part of Indonesia that's Hindu now, the island of Bali mostly. And the rest of it is, is Muslim. But the narratives, the stories that are played and that are dominant in the Wayang Kulit theater come from Hinduism for the most part. They're mixed with other uh, themes and other religions and other uh, folk traditions, etc. But much of it comes from the Hindu uh, stories, particularly these really big epics. Um, and it's, it's a little bit difficult to talk about the complexity of the religion, so I won't really. But Kosh uses this uh, Hindu element, and he even doesn't just use the Wayang theater, but he makes references to other Hindu deities. Um, he sees, he shows uh, Sukarno as somebody who is like Vishnu, and in some ways like Shiva as well, which are really powerful uh, Hindu gods. And uh, he uses the mother goddess a lot, which has a very rich... Um, religious significance in Hinduism. So I've got some images of these. Um, and at the end he uses the figure of Kali, who is a really um, terrifying figure. She has a really positive side, but she's also often used to suggest the necessity of destruction or of violence, and or the, the loss of control that leads to violence. So we've got a lot of interesting elements, particularly when all hell breaks, breaks loose towards the end of the novel. It's like Kali comes out kind of a thing, right? And uh, um, and so there's some in, interesting ways that he uses uh, the mother goddess. And finally, he uses some fascinating astronomical types of ideas. And in Hinduism, you've got this idea of ether that's quite developed. And so you might take a look at, at this and think, well, why does Kosh use this idea of this space? And it comes up in a number of ways. It comes up particularly in the hissing sound. And, you know, he, uh, the narrator, Cookie, is writing the story in Australia to the sound of his lamp in the... The outback. I don't know if he's in the outback. Actually, I'm not exactly can't quite remember where he is. Somewhere in Australia, but he's out in the countryside, and he's got the hissing of this lamp. But it's the same lamp, the same kind of lamp that we associate with the light that is used in the Wayang Theater, right? And he's 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 connecting things from Australia to India to outer space to the big meanings of things, and sometimes by using some of these uh, Hindu deities, it fits as well. So it's, it's kind of a complicated thing, and if you were found that interesting, you could go into it and write an essay on it, for example. It's pretty tricky in both The Quiet American and Year of Living Dangerously what the authors are doing with religion, so it, it would be demanding, but an interesting topic. So uh, you, might want, you might think of doing that. Okay, so let's go back to uh, the... So, yeah, these are the different things that you could take a look at uh, in this uh, course uh, site. But also, I strongly suggest that you take a look at the Year of Living Dangerously film. It, Peter Weir is a well-known Australian director, and the film is quite well done. The music is interesting. The, uh, the, the portrayal of Billy Kwan is 
I think it's Linda Hunt does uh, Billy. Uh, it's a it's a woman playing a man's role, um, and she's really really good. And listen to the music and oh, the, the way things are done in this film is is really quite powerful. I think it's a bit slow uh, for our taste perhaps now, but it's really worth taking a good look at. Okay, so now what I want to do is jump into the um, first chapter of the first part. And again, this, don't worry about these. These are just terms that I guess are used in the Wayang Kulet to denote the time that the theater is being played in. And so don't worry about the details there, unless you wanted to write on it. So we see right at the very beginning the importance of the Wayang, but we see it in terms of a, of a bar. And so all of these foreign journalists are sitting in a bar, but it's the Wayang bar, the darkness of the Wayang bar. And so right away, you know, if you if you didn't know the importance of the word Wayang, and you didn't know like what I was talking to you about, you would probably skip over that. But you'll notice that the details start to combine here. There's red candles that flicker, a ring of electric lamps set high on the gold walls. Now it's very similar to what you have in the Wayang Kulet itself. A ring of electric lamps set high on the gold walls across which were fixed Javanese shadow puppets, the heroes and villains of the Wayang Kulet. Sorry, just need to get to the next part. So now he is giving a, a setting that you can relate to, and the hotel is interesting. Inside this setting, He's suggesting that um, the Wayang is important, this idea of theater is important. And now he's expanding it out to Sukarno's world and suggesting that Sukarno is creating a theater for the people. And that, a sense that it, in this sense, it's not as genuine or deep in a, in a sort of religious or cultural sense as the Wayang Kulit. It's a more of a, of a theater of propaganda, anti-Western rhetoric, that divides the world into these new forces and the old forces. And he's warming his ego at the blaze. And so in a sense, it's slowly, uh, Kosh is slowly creating Sukarno as the puppet master who's next to the light that is cast, uh, which makes the puppets show up on the screen. And uh, he's using a lot of anti-Western rhetoric in a kind of confrontation. It meant that it's very difficult for white faces uh, to be there because they're like ridiculous badges um, and they're like men in masks. But in this Wyong bar, they can kind of drop that because this is a world that's separate. It's a world for Westerners and people, the elite who have power and money, international elite and Indonesians. And so they're not out there in the world where they can get people who might be aggressive toward them. And that's why it's so important when Hamilton walks out of the, the hotel and he goes out into a little part of the city and he deals, he starts coming face to face with the people who live there. And ultimately with the Betjack drivers, right? Who are like the Trishaw drivers in Quiet American. And Wally is an interesting character because he's got a lot of uh, cynicism. He's been there a long time. And here he's joking that the, that Sukarno is like a god. And Quan says, well, he is like a god to the villagers. Because at this point, Quan is, is thinking that Sukarno means what he's saying. And he's thinking that Sukarno will actually help his people and that everything will be uh, positive. And it will come out all right. Have you ever seen him arrive into a village in his white helicopter? To them, he's Vishnu, coming down from heaven in his magic car. And I think he's conflating the real world helicopter with the magic car that you get in the Wayang Kulet puppet theater where he comes down into the puppet play. If you take a look on one of the, sh one of the pages that I've got, I think it's on the context page for this novel, or for Sukarno, it's under Sukarno's years, that Sukarno's year, that's it. I have a little section on this Marhanism, which is a sort of Indonesian version of Marxism that Sukarno is seeming to 
push. Now, the question, of course, in the novel is, is this going to be a homegrown Indonesian thing, or is he going to lean toward China and Russia into the communist section of the world and therefore raise the, the problem of the involvement of the British and the Americans and all of the other capitalist forces, right, and, and join the Cold War problem. And this is an interesting depiction with the Wyang puppets up on the walls, their grotesque insect noses bent. Now they're almost um, malevolent at this point towards the floor, seem to watch us too with pensive contempt. But I wouldn't say that in general they're malevolent here at all. Uh, this is just probably the way that um, some of the Western journalists feel. And the distinction between the Hotel Indonesia and the outside is made quite clear. And you can see that Quan, who doesn't want to live in luxury, feels it very strongly. He feels the discrepancy between, or the difference between the, the wealthy people in the hotel and the people outside, particularly the Beth Jack boys. He says, this is the most expensive shopping boulevard in Jakarta, Quan said, right here in the hotel. The city's bankrupt. So you can see that, you know, the hotel has the most expensive shopping in the city, which is the capital of the country, right? I'm pretty sure it's the capital. Uh, anyway, sorry, it, it's definitely the biggest city anyway. Um, and the city itself is bankrupt. So the, the, the stark difference between the hotel and the city is, is really clear. And so in this first chapter, we get Hamilton going out through the arches and notice that the hotel Indonesia is often seen as a kind of a stage. And again, think about the Wayang Kulit, which is this puppet theater with a stage in a sense. But now you've got um, the Wayang Bar, which is a kind of a stage. You've got Sukarno's revolution or his sort of um, his, his oratory and his trying to move people in his uh, ideology as a kind of a stage. And now you've got the hotel itself as they move away from it as a kind of a stage. And notice how all these things are seen in terms of the Wayang Coulette. Black limousines moved in an endless caravan around a semicircle of driveway. The 14-story hotel in Indonesia rode like a luxury ship in mid-ocean. Here he's switching metaphors and he's moving out from the hotel on the six-lane highway uh, and so here you've got a, a highway that is supposed to be a sign of prestige. And so you're going from this prestigious hotel on this highway, but then along the way it breaks down and you start to see the average people. And so this, this road takes Hamilton and Quan away from the wealthy and the powerful to those who don't have the wealth and the power. And the, the novel's sort of emotional direction, I think, is towards the Betjak drivers, it's towards Ibu, and it's towards, you know, the poor people and the ones who are the victims of this terrible disparity in wealth. Passing out of the hotel's neutral compound into Jakarta, between the pillars of the gates, they arrived first at a no-man's land of broken, stony ground. A permanent crowd of vagrants kept watch from the car park on the forbidden, glowing stage of the arcade. And so there this idea of wealth and power and money, well, wealth and money are the same thing, this idea of power and money, it's like, a, to the average person, it's like a foreign thing. It's like some kind of a, a, a wealthy production that they're not part of, really. And on the foreigners who emerge from it, so did a row of gym crack jeep taxis and a small squadron of the tricycle rickshaws called bet jacks. As soon as they sighted Hamilton and Quan, most of the Betjacks creaked into motion like a flock of ponderous birds wheeling towards them. And notice the way these Betjacks are, are seen. You could easily write, you know, if I don't go into it, you could write on the way that they're seen metaphorically. Their black canvas hoods, their sides painted in hurdy-gurdy gurdy colors with pictures of volcanoes and Wyong heroes and lettered with names such as Tiger and Bima, they belong to another time. Three of the jet, bet jacks continued to follow, shattered 
shadowed, sorry, shadowed by these hooded shapes. And so they're almost like these animated creatures from mythology that follow Hamilton and they kind of scare Hamilton because they're a representation of the poor and the people that he doesn't really understand. He understands the people in the air-conditioned hotel in Indonesia, but he doesn't understand the people in the bazaar. And then we get a description of it. Uh, the blue lamps receding on arrogant steel standards appeared on the point of fading out. The showpiece highway was already cracked and potholed, and the humble food stalls of the poor had begun to creep along its edges. So you've got the, it's really coming, it's really animating this, so that you've got the stalls are creeping. Its traffic consisted mostly of converted jeeps, bicycles, and bet jacks. So it keeps bringing up this, the idea of the poor people. And then, of course, he um, contrasts it with Sukarno's world, the, sh the, the play world, the, the, um, the sort of artificial uh, theater world that Sukarno's created in the hotel, particularly, but also in his... Um, in his anti-Western rhetoric. So the procession of bet jacks, and so as they move out from the hotel, they're being followed by the bet jacks, melted away. And two of the bet jacks had now wheeled off into the blue spaces of the highway, like baffled birds of prey. The third rider, a stern-faced man in a black shirt, black shorts, and a wide-brimmed straw hat, continued to follow steadily without calling out. The side of his machine carried the yellow legend, Tango Malam, which we find out only at the very end of the novel, and here again I'm going to be, give you a spoiler, is Midnight. And so you can try to imagine what that might mean, and you might also think that this, remember that this novel is heading toward, if you look at the history of 1965 Indonesia, a very drastic, catastrophic uh, massacre of people. And so it's heading in a really bad direction. And so I think Kosh is using the bet jacks here to bring a sense of ominousness. Likewise, he's, he's uses the Hindu goddesses who aren't normally seen like the like goddesses like you know the mother goddess uh, Durga or someone like that it isn't always seen in a negative way, obviously. But here he's using Kali and Durga to suggest a kind of catastrophe that's coming. On an area of muddy ground beside the highway, the lights from the bazaar burns. So now he's in not the market that's in the, the most expensive market that's in the hotel, but he's in the market of the poor. And he's also seeing it in terms of some of the elements that you've got in the Wayang. For example, the lamps again. And so the lamps are connecting a lot of different things. As I was saying, they were even suggested that they connect to cookie who's writing the story in Australia, and he hears the hiss of the lamp, right? And you've also got the lamps which are used in the Wayang Kulit. And you've got the kerosene gas pressure lamps set on the counters of many little stalls under tattered awnings. Here the condition of the people was revealed. And Quan feels this really deeply. Quan is the one who's bringing Hamilton into this. He's wanting Hamilton to see it, to, to not just focus on the politics, but to focus on the people <coughs> who are like directly, realistically affected by the politics. And he asks this question, what then must we do? And this is, I think, a question which echoes throughout the novel. Kumar asks it in various ways. Sorry, Hamilton learns to start asking the question, but it's a very vexed question. And of course, Quan doesn't really know what to do either. He's a bit um, lost in this novel because the problem is so great. He connects to Ibu, who's a woman who probably was at one time a prostitute, and she has a child who's sick because of the poverty, because of no clean water, and there's nothing he can do. And uh, so it's a really vexed question, and it's a huge question that uh, Kosh is trying to explore from different angles. Then, what then must we do? And we keep having the bet jack come up again and again, 
again here as well. And the last image we get is it wheeling, image at the end of chapter anyway, is it wheeling in miniature under the highway's blue light. So it makes us, it reminds us that Quan's now inside the Bet Jack, going to where he lives, which is not the Hotel Indonesia. And we've got the, the fancy highway built for the, the wealthy probably. And Quan is going to use that road to go to where he's going to live closer to the people. He doesn't really live like the people and he's got lots of money and that kind of thing. But he tries to get closer and he tries to take pictures of their plight. And so the, the images are really quite important. And in the film, it's exceptionally moving when he, <laughs> it moves me anyway, I'm, I'm feeling emotional about it, uh, when he, you know, realizes um, the trouble that the poor people get. And I won't go into exactly the trouble because I should leave one or two details uh, unspoiled. Uh, he realized the desperation of the poor. He looks up at his photos and the classical music is playing. It's such a powerful moment in that film. You, you should really uh, take a look at the film. It's, it's really worth uh, exploring and enjoying. So anyway, I think that's good. That's enough for an introduction and I'll talk to you next week.